I was like, I'm getting ready to walk into my mom and dad's house as my authentic self. What's up, man? What's up? What's good, good people? It's Pride Month, and I had the chance to get to know some really cool guys. It was... Yeah, just watch. <laughs> they try to tell you gay men are a monolith, but after hearing these stories, I don't know. It's just not adding up. How old were you when you started to tell people or felt comfortable with involving people in your interest with men? Ooh, it just I guess that's a, a loaded question. Um, I think that uh, I would say publicly. Uh, I was probably when I got married on the Grammys in front of 30 million people when it was extremely open. But before that, I was 27 when I told my parents. And uh, all my close friends knew ever since I was, when I came out in 1993, uh, a week before my 21st birthday. Uh, first time going to a club, I was in college. And so people that, you know, my close friends knew. And I started to create my own family. So they knew my friends. 27 for my immediate family, the world at 30, I'm telling my age now, uh, I think I was 40, I think I was 40. So what were some of your fears around letting people in in that way? Oh my gosh. So uh, just a little background about me and why it was, uh, why I had fears. Um, I am the tender age of 48 now. So I didn't have what a lot of people have now, just a reference of what uh, gay or homosexual or um, whatever that was, I didn't have a, a vision of what I looked like in anybody um, because there was no internet. You know, I literally was going through this stuff before the internet uh, became popular, before people even knew how to use the internet. So I was born and raised in Atlanta, uh, in the province of Atlanta, and uh, I'm the oldest of three boys. So the three boys and my mom and dad were both around my entire life. Uh, but growing up in Atlanta uh, and being someone that was raised in the projects of Atlanta, uh, my mom and dad had a lot of hopes and dreams for me. And uh, I was just having this conversation yesterday. A good friend of mine sent me something about uh, the first time you start to feel or you think or you learn that being gay is not the most popular thing or that it was really bad was actually going to the barbershops like at one or two years old and uh, when I got my first haircut, I really wasn't thinking about that, but I think I started to realize I was different uh, in kindergarten. And uh, knowing that it was wrong, I used to ask my best friend, and this was, then you like girls or guys? And he was like, of course I like girls. What do you like? I said, oh, I like girls too. And then going to the barbershop, everybody's talking about what gay, I didn't even know what the word gay was, but everybody would laugh about that kind of stuff. Are there any spaces now where you're still self-conscious about your sexual orientation? You know, it... I think it is just a little bit of rewiring. Again, I'm, I'll be 49 this year. And I got married um, in front of 30 million people when I was 40. Programming myself all the way up to that part was started to, you know, it started to be once I got, when I, once I was 12 years old, the rewiring, rewiring started with, I need to find out how I can, diffuse any kind of situation of people thinking I was gay. So I started to kind of cold switch my own self. Like, you know, what can I do so people don't think I'm gay? Um, so I don't have to go to a barbershop shop and, you know, and feel like, uh, you know, I, I think I brought on my own self bullying. Uh, Cause I thought, you know, listen to people at the barbershop, how they laughed at people. I didn't want to be someone they laughed at. I was already uh, an odd kid growing up. I remember, you know, anytime you said the word gay, when you were out at a restaurant with a friend, you would, I would whisper it like, you know, he's gay. You know, you know, he's, you know, and kind of do that thing. And, you know, I remember even though I had gay friends and we wanted to go to the movies together just as friends, you know, we had the code switch. And I remember being um, relatively new because of my fear that you go to the movie theater, but you know, you would sit one, have one seat in between each other. Like, okay, like we're supposed to be, you know, here with our boys and, and that kind of thing. I remember us having conversations after I got married where, um, I would still be, I would still be doing that. Like everybody knew at that point that we were one of the, the premier African-American couples that got married on the Grammys by Queen Latifah. And I would still at the airports, like, you know, this is supposed to be my husband, but yet 
I'm afraid to like kiss him when he's going or or kiss him when we like regular, you know, I would say just like straight people were doing. I, I, I wanted to not do that. And um, I still found myself whispering when I say, like, hey, and then I was like, I just got to get out of that and like truly live my authentic self because I didn't realize after that there's so many gifts and, and awards and we, we have this little saying between ourselves that, you know, membership has its privileges. And I will say that being authentically me and being gay has opened up so many doors. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited about that. I wish I would have knew this when I was much, much younger. Yeah. I know it's a lot, right? No, I love that. I love that. <laughs> so you brought up marriage. So is there any piece of advice that you would give to a young queer person who's aspiring to marriage? Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, people have to realize that, you know, being married, you 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 are not going in there uh, being perfect. Marriage is not perfect. Marriage is a lot of compromise. I would say about 80% compromise. Um, you can lose yourself or you can grow from it. Um, I think that, uh, and especially in my case, you know, being with someone for 13 years, um, I think that we all change and then we have to realize at some point how much more compromise are you willing to do together or is it a point where you decide to go your separate ways so you can grow even further. Um, and what I've kind of pegged as um, something that's very... Um, synonymous to that is um, the growth of a garden. You know, like when roses, in order for roses to grow, you actually have to trim away the ones that are like wiltering. And when you trim away, you know, the new ones come out bigger and better. And that's kind of what, you know, marriage and life and relationships are, that they don't have to, um, you know, always be forever that, you know, you would want them to, but there's still growth in walking away from that and growing even more individually. There's often a lot of conversation around relationships being difficult in the gay community. Mm -hmm. Why do you think like, it's difficult to cultivate relationships, grow relationships, start a relationship, be in a relationship? Is it because of hookup culture? What do you think? It goes back to that 12 year old kid that was going to the barbershop. You know, you start to learn how to not only deceive other people, but you start to deceive yourself and you start to you start to find out that um, that it's okay to lie because you're not you're lying to everybody when people don't know who you are authentically. And if you can lie about your sexuality or who you are to people, you don't owe anybody any honesty. You know what I mean? I think that you know there's this whole thing about cheating and all those kind of things, but um, you can be in a relationship, and you know sometimes in this culture we are always looking for acceptance, right? Because of that 12 year old boy that was talking about the barbershop, you get that acceptance, you know, especially in a, a group of gay attractive men, you will always get instant acceptance, instant gratification, and you kind of feed into that to deliver what you didn't get when you were 12 years old, when you were not getting accepted by everybody, you know? And then uh, oftentimes those messages are mixed with, um, you know, hook up, you know, sexuality, you know, sexual escapades and um, this conquering thing because we are trying to, um, and this is all my opinion, you know, I think that we are trying to salvage what we were not able to do in the strength that we didn't have when we were younger. And we just keep carrying that on and on. And that's why sometimes it's hard to be in a relationship because you're constantly out there trying to find um, this gratification that you might have missed early on. So you brought that 12 year old boy in the barbershop. Mm -hmm. um, what would you tell him? If you go back and tell him something, what would you say? Ooh. What I would tell um, the younger me is that, um, you know, just kind of hold on. Hold on and um, not only is it going to be better, uh, you will be living your best life. It's going to take some years, you know, it's going to take 30 years, but um, I wouldn't give the number, <laughs> but I would say, you know, just hold on because everything that you are insecure about at 12 will end up being your superpowers, pretty much. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, thank you. I end all my conversations with keep creating space. How do you think we can create space for young queer men? Um, I think we can create space for young queer men. Um, and that's kind of my mantra is, uh, and it's a mantra of my apparel company, which is be authentic, uh, be bold, be authentic, and be inspiring. 
Um, that has carried my brand so far because I think it speaks to me. And what I've learned out of that and to create space for other queer men is to um, lead in service. And that's what I do now as I am the program chair for fashion for all the art institutes across the country. And I don't have any kids of my own, but you know, those students make me realize that they all come first. And if I can, I'm always talking about putting skin in the game and I always put my skin in the game and I always uh, make myself a martyr for whatever it is. Um, because I think tangibility uh, in queer men is uh, the most important thing. So that's why, even though I got married on the on the Grammys and I got divorced in a public way, I think that um, you know those conversations need to be talked about. So uh, we don't have to keep living in this world of highlight reels, which is what social media is to me. That there's this level of perfection that doesn't allow us to get close to other gay, gay men and relationships because we are often disappointed by what we end up meeting because of the highlight reel. And that continues, this, you know, perpetuates this cycle of not ever being happy uh, because we're looking for happiness in other people based on what we see. But, you know, being happy yourself and if you can really meet other people and hear their conversations, I think that that's the most important. So, you know, creating space for queer men for me means to lead in service and to make myself uh, a living example as much as I can. What's good, good people? I'm just popping in to say happy pride. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I'm going to bring Octavius back. Keep watching. Stay tuned for the next episode. Um, and yeah. <laughs> my name is Octavius Terry and my pride is authenticity. So let's keep creating space. Peace. Thank you.